So, I'd like you to take a Bible. By the way, how many, who's got Bibles today? Go on, who's got Bibles? Have you all got Bibles? You've all got Bibles? Wow, this church is changing. I remember a time, quite a long time ago, I used to say, who's got a Bible? And nobody got one. So now we all get Bibles. We can all follow along. So we're in Luke chapter 1, and we're in verse 38. And we've got two passages, very, very interesting passages. So Luke chapter 1, verse 38, we're starting, paragraph 4. And um, it's very interesting. Do you remember when I was giving an introduction to Luke's gospel, I said that Luke was a doctor. He was the com faithful companion of the Apostle Paul. And he was, as a doctor, very interested in people. And so because he's interested in people, unlike Matthew's gospel and Mark's gospel, he mentions women a lot. He mentions children a lot. Guess what? He mentions disease a lot. He mentions psychological issues a lot. I love Luke. Because Luke is the person who presents to us the gospel of the kingdom and he presents to us the gospel of the kingdom in relation to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And this is, a, this is funnily enough, we call it a gospel, but it's actually a letter written to his friend Theophilus. He says, I felt it was good. I felt it was good. Myself and the Lord, we felt that the Holy Spirit got, was guiding me to write to you to give you an orderly account of all the, all the events that we most assuredly believe. He says, Theophilus, I want you to be sure about the events and the circumstances and the people and what happened in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So verse 38 says, And Mary said... Oh, sorry, have I got the wrong... No, I'm, I'm all right. Mary said, Behold the handmaiden of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. So what Mary was doing, she was speaking to this angel. It was the, the, the angel Gabriel. And he told her all the story about what was going to be happening in her life and what God wanted to do. And immediately she submitted to it. Now, when you contrast that with the old prophet, and the old priest, Zechariah, Zechariah didn't believe a word of it. Isn't that funny? Isn't that ironic? That we get this Jewish context in which the old prophet and the old priest of Israel didn't believe the word of God, which is why he and his wife were under the judgment of God and they were barren. And this young girl, this young girl, 16, maybe, 17, could have been as young as 15, but more likely to be 18, 17, 18, and she has faith in God. She's part of the new generation that really does believe. Wow, it's quite a difference. And it's very interesting that these first two paragraphs are all about two women. Uh, and they're going to surprise you. They, you men, you can go to sleep now, okay? All that Christmas turkey and all that stuff. You've got to sleep now. You women, sit up and listen now, because now you're going to learn about what it is to be a godly woman. That's what we're going to learn about today. And it starts off with Mary saying, whatever you want to do in my life, Lord, I'm here. Do you know what? God has been waiting for you in your life to say that to him for years and years and years and years for many people people and you've tried this and tried that and done this job and done that and done, improved this and changed this and God is just waiting for you women to say you do it God you do it in my life and I'm prepared to believe in you for it I'm prepared to trust in you for it that's exciting this is the new start this is what January is all about this is what the new start is the new start is saying to God, I will let you do in my life what you've come to do. That's exciting. Because suddenly a whole world opens up. This isn't a world of your own conniving. This isn't a world of your own arrangement. This isn't a world of, of, of networking with your friends. This is a world where God steps in and does something in the life of a young woman. That's exciting. 
She submits herself to the will of God for her life. Her one job in life, now listen to this, listen to this carefully, her one job in life was to be a preacher. No, 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 no. Her one job in life is to be a community leader. No, no, no. Her one job in life is to be the CEO of her own company. No, that's not, no, sorry. Her one job in life was to be a mother. Got that now. If you're a young girl, your one job in life is to be a mother and to be the best mother to the best person that's ever going to live. That's the Lord Jesus. What a privilege we have. What a privilege. What a privilege. Elizabeth, she desired to be the best mother as well. She was going to be the best mother to the best prophet that had ever walked this earth. John the Baptist. But this woman, Mary, this young slip of a girl, Mary, she was going to be the very best mother to the one who was going to be the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And you know what, you know, when the Lord Jesus is crowned King and Lord of Lords in a future day, do you know what they'll say? They'll say, and his mother was Mary. Why do they say that? If you go back to the Old Testament and you list all the kings, they'll say, so-and-so became king and his mother was called so and so, why is that then? Why is the Queen Mother always mentioned? I'll tell you why. Because when the old king dies and the young man is inexperienced and doesn't really know all the wisdom his father had, his mother remembers it. And it's her job to sit beside him on the throne and it's her job to whisper in his ear, what your father would do is this. And he says, ah, yes, thank you. She's his guide. And if you're a mother, you are the guide of your children. You're the one that sets the tone in the home. The man goes out to work every day, comes home, hasn't got a clue what went on. <coughs> but you mothers, you have an opportunity to, to mould and to change the life of a young boy and to make him a man of God. The, the wonderful example of this in the Old Testament is Hannah. She gave him up as a little boy of perhaps three or four to, to the temple, to a wicked temple, to a wicked priest who had terrible sons. But she just knew this was what God wanted. But you know what? In those first three years, she trained that little boy in such a way that she was happy for him to go. Because she knew that she'd instilled in that little boy the right character. She instilled in him a love of righteousness. She instilled in him a hatred of wickedness. That's the greatest thing any mother can ever instill in her little boy. Anyway, I mustn't go on about that. Mary wasn't the best mother in all the world. She wasn't the best of anything, but she did the very best that she could. That's the point. She did the very best that she could. And verse 39, Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into the city of Judah. Now, I used to write, and in fact, I wrote this and preached on it three or four times, that uh, Mary went down to Hebron where they lived. No, she didn't. No. You see, at this particular time in the story, he, they were in the hill country of Judea. They weren't down in Hebron, a long, long way away, 80, 80 90 miles away. They were up in the hill country next to the temple. Why? Because Zechariah was the priest in the temple. He couldn't go all the way from Hebron to... They couldn't commute in those days. No, they had to be near to the temple. And that's where he went. And she entered into the house of Zechariah and saluted Elizabeth. You say, she didn't stand there like that. No, 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 no. A salutation means a greeting. And she would have, the greeting traditionally in Israel is, the Lord is with you. And the answer always came back, and with you also. Take a look at the book of Ruth and you'll see that when Boaz greeted, he always said, the Lord is is with you. It was the traditional greeting. She entered into the house of Zechariah. She saluted Elizabeth. Verse 41. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb. John the Baptist. Six months. He'd been in the womb six months. He wasn't born yet. 
Yes, but he was filled with the Holy Spirit, as was Elizabeth. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Wow. What an amazing thing. We were talking about this just the other day, you know. There are a number of people in the Bible that are referred to as great. Okay? We've all heard of Alfred the Great. There's about a hundred or so people in the history of the world that are referred to as the great. About a hundred people. But did you know that there are people in the Bible that are referred to as the great? There are. For example... We get John the Baptist, it says of the angel, he shall be great. It says of the Lord Jesus, and he shall be great. But it says of the Virgin Mary, it says she shall be blessed. Wow. This is why people call her the Blessed Virgin Mary. She is the Blessed Virgin Mary. She's blessed, why? Well, the expression blessed is an expression that's used in the Bible to describe all those people who are faithful Jews according to the Old Covenant. That's why when you get into Matthew 5, he starts off, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. And he outlines eight personal characteristics and also eight personal experiences of God's blessing in the Old Covenant. Nothing to do with being a Christian at that time. But she calls her blessed. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And that's the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus, he's also referred to as the blessed. Because he's the one who will have a heart that is completely true to his covenant God. When Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the child jumped in her womb. Those of you that have been pregnant, I haven't, I'm afraid. You know, with all the, you know, I, I haven't. We went in for a, a, ma a pregnant man's competition once. I didn't win. I didn't win. I reckon I was about four months. I'm not sure. Um, but there's no such thing as a pregnant man. But those of you that have ever been pregnant will know what it is when the baby leaps. This baby leaped. It leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So that she could prophesy. You say, well, what is this filling of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit so was moving in her heart and mind that she was able to work in the prophetic ministry. She was able to be a prophetess. Wow. And she declares, she makes a prophecy. She says, blessed art thou amongst women. That's a prophecy. And she says, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Now, how did Elizabeth know? How did Elizabeth know? You see, Mary had come from Gabriel. And there was no telegram, there was no internet. She couldn't send a text in advance. She couldn't FaceTime, couldn't do any of that. She turned up at the house and Elizabeth knew everything that had gone on. How did she know? She had divine revelation from God about the whole story. That's what she had. That's a prophetess. <coughs> she just knocked and walked in. And after Elizabeth's prophetic greeting, Mary responds with a greeting in return of amazing depth and insight. Now all you men, all you theologians, sit up and take notice. Here's a woman that's going to teach you something. And it's not anything about Christianity. This is a prophecy about the old covenant and how men and women stood before God in the old covenant and how God moved amongst his ancient people. That's what it's going to be all about. So what are you going to say? Well, Elizabeth, first of all, she says, And whence is this, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? How did Elizabeth know that the baby that Mary was carrying, which would have been absolutely un unknown at that time. She wouldn't, she wouldn't show a baby at all. Probably only a few weeks pregnant, if that. How did, how, did Elizabeth, how did Elizabeth know that Mary was carrying a baby? Because she was in a prophetic experience. She knew things that couldn't be known by men. She was knowing things that God knows and that revealed to her. 
And as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy, and blessed is she that believed. For there shall be a performance of those things which were told her of the Lord. Let me ask you something. How did Elizabeth know that Mary had believed the message of Gabriel? Because the Lord had told her. You see, this is the prophetic ministry. It's way beyond anything you and I have ever experienced. There's no such thing as a prophetic ministry like this today. Not at all. But in those days, in Israel, there was. And this is it. She says, blessed is she that believed. You know, a lot of people say a lot of silly stuff about Mary. There's lots two things that we can do wrong about Mary. One is that we can venerate her. That's wrong. We can honour her, but venerating her, no. We certainly can't pray to her. Talking to a dear, dear friend of mine many years ago, I said, do you ever pray to God? He went, oh, no, 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 no. I pray to Mary. She does all my praying for me. I said, well, then you're not praying. Because Mary can't hear you. And she got nothing she can do about it. There's nothing she can do about it. She's just a sinner that believed. Is she? Yeah. She referred to God, my Savior. She was just a sinner saved. And she was a sinner that believed the message of the angel. So she refers to Mary as the mother of my Lord. How did Elizabeth know? How could Elizabeth know that the little baby that was even unable to be seen at this moment in time was going to be the Lord of glory. How did she know that? How did she know that that little tiny, tiny, tiny little fetus that was the size of a peanut perhaps was going to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one that would be referred to as the Son of the Highest? How did she know all that? See, we're moving in an area here that's way beyond human knowledge or experience. <coughs> Let's look at the next, next part. Starting at verse 46, this is what we call Mary's song of praise. Mary's song of praise is both touching and glorious. We'll read, you'll see that in a moment. Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord. What does magnify mean? It means to make it bigger. She says, My soul is in a state whereby God has become bigger to me. Let me ask you something. How big is he to you? In many of our lives, it's just a little part, a little, little an hour, it's an hour once a week on a Sunday morning, that's it. No, no. Mary says, God has become so big to me, he said, she says, it's, it's like as if he fills up every hour of every day. My sight of him has grown. I see him as far greater than ever. And my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Now the old Roman Catholic doctrine of the Immaculate Conception is heresy. I'm going to say that very emphatically. It is heresy. You say, well, what is it that they're saying when they say that? It was something that was invented not long ago, by the way. And they suddenly have this idea that we're going to make Mary so great and so wonderful that she never sinned. In fact, even Mary herself was born of a virgin. That's heresy. You see, she was born in a particularly normal average, ordinary manner. She was an ordinary woman. She was a sinner who needed a saviour. And there was nothing specially holy about her until the day when she had the Holy Spirit perform an operation in her body to produce the Holy Son of God. That's the only thing holy about her. That's the only thing. And God was going to bless her in such a manner 
that he would deliver her from obscurity. He would deliver her from a desperate life of grinding poverty. And he would deliver her from the very lowest status amongst women. You know what it's like amongst women, don't you? I'm talking to the women here. You know what it's like amongst women. There's certain people that you, oh my word, oh my word, look at that. See what, see what that was went by then. But there's other women, and they don't have a second look. She was very ordinary. She was very plain. She was very low status. And the Lord Jesus and God the Father and the Holy Spirit were going to deliver her from all of that. Her life was never going to be like that again. Verse 48, and she, he says, for he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. She says, look, I'm just nobody. I can't even believe he ever looked at me. I can't even believe that God would ever take any notice of me at all about anything. Now that's not humility, that's just honesty. She wasn't of any importance. The only thing that was important about her life was what God did in her life. That's all, nothing else. He says, she says, for behold, from henceforth, all generations shall call me blessed. She's blessed. Is she blessed because she was wonderful? No. She's blessed because God was wonderful to her. That's why. She can never hold her head up in a crowd saying, look at me, look at me, aren't I great? She'd be too humble for that. But she'd walk through the midst of that crowd and she'd know that deep within her heart, God had touched her. And God had privileged her. And God had made her holy in a way that was beyond all imagination. And God had given to Mary this sacred trust, this little, little baby. A little baby to feed, a little baby to change, a little baby to cuddle, a little baby to love. That was the greatest honour of her life. Verse 50. Oh, sorry, verse 49. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. You know, when you go out into the world, those of you, that, I mean, this is just for the women today, by the way, you fall asleep now, Harley and David and everybody else. When you go out into the world, there's only one thing that you can ever claim to fame is this. There's only one thing that you can ever claim to fame, listen carefully, is that he that is mighty has done great things to me and his name is holy. That's the only thing. Don't you go out into the world and tell everybody about your degrees and your, and your qualifications and your money and your prestige and all of that. That means nothing. Nothing. Take it from a woman who was of the lowest of the lowest of the lowest standing in society. Take it from her. But the only thing that's ever to her credit is this, what God has done. Not what she did. And then she goes on to make a prophecy. Verse 50. She says, listen carefully now. You men can wake up to this. It's very important. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. Now that's not the Christian gospel. This isn't the grace of God. This is the mercy of God. You say, what's the difference? There's a great deal of difference between mercy and grace. You see, mercy is when God, and you don't deserve it, withholds his judgments from you. That's his mercy. And grace is when God gives you his blessings and you don't deserve it. That's a big difference there. Big difference. Huge difference. God is merciful on all those that fear him. From generation to generation. Now let me ask you something. If you're a Christian here, put your hand up. Good. Have your children become Christians simply because you were one? No, of course not. 
Your children didn't become Christians because you're a Christian. My mother and father were Christians, but not all the children became Christians. Right. But here we're talking about something else. Here we're talking about the children of Israel. And, he, and she says, and the mercy of God on all those that fear him, right, will be from generation to generation to generation. Now that fits. That's correct. But notice, she doesn't say, and his salvation is on them that fear him. Nobody gets saved by fearing God. Nobody. There's a different F you need if you want to be saved, and that's have faith in God, right? But who gets saved by fearing God? Nobody gets saved. But the children of Israel were preserved in their unique relationship with their covenant God because they were frightened to death of him. And every single time they sinned, a cold shiver ran down their spine and they thought to themselves, is this it now? Am I going to be struck down with a sickness? Am I going to get a leprosy? Am I going to get, am I going to get all my house burnt down now? Because I've sinned against my Lord God, the covenant God. They were frightened to death of him. No wonder they went very quickly to the temple and offered a blood sacrifice for sin. And they walked away with a great sigh of relief. Why? Not because their sins were taken away, but their sins had been covered. They'd been put out of sight until the time when Christ would come. Of course, they didn't know anything about that. You see, the fear of God for the Israelite was the key of knowledge. It was the key. It was the one little thing. You could walk down the street in Israel... And you could divide every single person that ever came before you into two camps. You could say, you go that side, you go that side. All you had to do is say to a man, do you fear God? And if he said yes, you say, right, move to the right. Do you fear God? No, I do not. To the left. And the whole of Israel was divided in this manner. Those that feared God. Those that did not. And then she goes on in her prophecy. She says, she, four more sentences. She says, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. Now let me ask you something. Which theologian talks as powerfully as this? None of them. None of them. This is properly powerful stuff. It's coming from a 16-year-old girl that knows God. And she understands her place in the, in, in the world. And she understands her nation in this covenant that she has with God. And she says about him, she says, He hath put down the mighty from their seats, and he exalted those of low degree. Have you noticed that in the world today? Have you noticed how God operates in Israel and in the nations? He takes those in high positions and he brings them right the way down and puts them in a dungeon sometimes. And he takes those of low degree and puts them on the throne. Praise God. You don't need to be involved in politics like this. God is involved in the politics like this. And she says, and not only that, but he fills the hungry with good things and he sends the rich away empty. Wow, what a God is this? This is the God of Mary. This is the God of the Old Testament. This is the God of Israel and their covenant God. You see, God is active in the world today doing this stuff. What else does she say? She says, and this is a very old-fashioned English word, she says, he hath helpen his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. He's helped them. He has helped the servant Israel in, in remembrance of his mercy. At that particular time, the Romans were crushing the life out of Israel. They were taxing them into oblivion. And as a result of that, God was moving against the whole land. There was famine. There was earthquakes. There was disease rampant. Why is it Jesus went around healing so many people? Because disease and sickness and leprosy and everything was rampant in the land. It should have never been there. There should have been no need for any hospitals in Israel whatsoever because whenever God is faithful to his covenant people, they never get sick. Get that now. They never get sick. Never. 
So why were they sick then? They were sick because they had forsaken God. Why is it that Zechariah, an old man perhaps in his 90s, is still serving in the temple? He's got no son to take his place. And why has he got no son? Because God has shut up the womb of his wife. He will not allow her to have the blessing of a child. Why? It's a judgment of God. And so what do we see in the life of Elizabeth? Eventually, in her old age, she brings forth a son. And what's his one job, which I might say, I think probably lasted for about one year of his life. One year of his life, he served God. Did he go up into the temple like his father and offer sacrifice? No, he did not, funnily enough. No. No, he stood in the wilderness and he called men in Israel to repent. That is to reconsider. That is to regret your lives. Regret your lives. Turn back to your covenant God and he'll take away all these judgments and he'll bless you beyond your wildest dreams. And one day, if you're faithful to him, you'll enter the kingdom that will last forever. That was the message of John. Now, there was not, not a single person ever became a Christian from listening to that. And, 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 and she says in verse 55, as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. These were the things, these were the things that were never spoken to any Christian church ever. These are the things that were spoken to Abraham and to the patriarchs and to their children and to all generations amongst Israel. You see, a lot of people are saying to me, coming to me saying, what's this about Israel? What's this about Israel? What's going on in Palestine? What's going on in, 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 uh, with Hamas? I said, listen, just forget about that. Read this passage. Read what Mary says. He has put down the mighty from their seats. And he will raise up those of low degree. God is going to do it all for you. You don't need to worry about Israel, you know. God will do everything for them. He might bring them to near annihilation, but he'll bless them in the end. And then verse 56. It says, Mary stayed there for about... Six, about three months. Why? Anybody know? Well, when she arrived, um, Elizabeth was six months pregnant. Or just about. So why did she stay for three months? She stayed for the birth. Of course she did. And in the birth of that little baby was all the hope of Israel. He was going to be the greatest prophet that's ever going to be born of women. And he's going to stand in the dirt of Israel. He's going to call upon God to witness against this evil people that they might repent of their sins and return to their covenant God and God would save them. That's the message. That's the message. She stayed for the birth of the little boy. And then she went home. Now let me ask you something. You say, well, what happened next, Steve? What happened next? Well, we'll talk about that next week, God willing. Keep you, on, keep you in suspense there. But let me just give you a little teaser. The next part of this story is picked up by Matthew. It's picked up by Matthew. Because Mary eventually goes back home. Back home to, back home to Nazareth. And uh, guess what? At Nazareth was her betrothed husband. They were betrothed together, but they had not been married yet. And... Now she's beginning to show up on. It's three months, you see. And Joseph says, oh, it's lovely to see you, Mary. And then he goes, what? What's this? She says, oh, I'm pregnant. Now, Joseph isn't a fool. He knows it isn't him. And so he considers, he's a man who fears God. And he considers, I'm going to have to divorce her. And he's awake in the night, and an angel of the Lord appears to him. Sorry, he's asleep. And the angel of the Lord appears to him and said, Don't be afraid. Mary has not been unfaithful. That holy thing which is in her 
is of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to do something, Joseph. I want you to marry her. I want you to marry the girl. But you must not consummate the marriage because she's already pregnant. And when that little baby is born, your job is to give him a name. His name is to be Jesus. Amen.